Hello, operators, whether you're tier one or tier none, you're welcome here. I was the white motorcycle policeman. And they say, oh, I love it. I love this. I love that. I love this. Um, and if I can give them a model to speak to and the sheriff can give them a model to speak to where, where hopefully they say, I love working for Chief Thomas and Sheriff Lamb, um, that what they're going to find is, especially for the cop world, when laterals go and ask around, because we're cops, we investigate stuff, you're going to go and ask around, and you're going to ask a few cops, like, hey, what do you think of this agency, or, you know, what do you think of your bosses? And I think we, we are one of the leaders in the state for cops who want to come be cops and just do the job to come to and be cops. And, and uh, we just got a, a good raise. We put in a good step plan. Um, that just went through, and, and this past uh, week, our employees uh, on the sworn side started seeing, they started reaping the benefit of that. Um, you hear that? Those of you that are my friends, <laughs> you will be buying lunch <clears throat> the next time I see you. You yeah. got a raise. I heard it from the chief yeah. deputy. There's, it's hitting your checks when? They got it the 15th? They, yeah, they got it already. Yeah. So, like, you Frank owes a bunch of people. Oh, yeah. <laughs> does he? Frank, that's twice in two separate podcasts you've been mentioned. Uh, so, and we have to mention Pew Pew Goddess. Yeah, if yeah. we're going to do that too, so you've all been satisfied and satiated. You're, you're, you're we've mentioned you. <laughs> as we, you've you've touched on when the guys mess up and things like that, but as a chief deputy, you you got to, you know, what anything keep you up at night? Any concerns? Yeah, uh, the safety of everybody. <clears throat> <clears throat> so you hit a spot, obviously. <laughs> um, my number one fear. <clears throat> God, I didn't know it was going to bother me like that. My number one fear is a phone call that uh, one of our people's heard. <clears throat> Sorry. Because uh, no, I've had a few of those, <laughs> and they're not fun to work through. Uh, and I care deeply about all of our people. So uh, that is, that's the one thing that uh, when my phone goes off at night, I'm always looking at <laughs> who's calling me. So if it's dispatch, I can... I'll be like, oh, God, please don't be one of our people. Um, if it's one of our captains or my chiefs, uh, obviously, if it's the jail chief, I'm thinking, shit, somebody escaped. Right, right. <laughs> um, if it's the road chief, uh, you know, my mind goes straight to shit, somebody's hurt. Um, but that is my number one fear is, is uh, that, that really eats at me is, is the safety of our people. And that's shared by the community as well. And don't ever apologize for having a spot hit like yeah. that because your people know that. And, and you met Brian earlier today, yeah. who, who's going to be on another podcast. Uh, it's even worse when you – and you're a small – not small agent, but you know everybody. Right, right. So it's not like you you know these guys' family, I assume. You know everybody, the gal's family. So that that is a horrible thing. Do you guys have a crisis management team process or access to one of those? Yeah, we do. We have uh – so internally, that was another thing that uh, Sheriff Lamb and I really felt that we needed to build up. And, and we had some good people working on it internally was our peer support and our crisis management. Um, and of course, we have all the typical you know county outlets that you can go to, the EAP and all that stuff. Um, but internally, in PCSO itself, uh, we have created, and, and I can't take credit for this because it's the group themselves that have done this. So the peer support group itself, the core group started... I supported that idea, so that that was the level of my doing of it is just supporting their idea, and then they ran with it, and they have blossomed that thing, and and now um, they are getting calls from other places in the county, other agencies, other departments within the county, that uh, somebody's in crisis, and our peer support team is helping them get through that, um, and so the peer support team is made up of all employees. I mean, we have civilians, we have sworn, we have detention. And essentially, we wanted to break down the walls of the whole taboo thing about talking about your problems and, and facing these issues because we all face them. And so we wanted to have a culture of, of them understanding that we all have regular lives. We all have regular crap that bothers us. 
And when that happens, because a lot of times we spend more time with each other than we do our, our families at home. Exactly. So when that happens, we want you to know that there's another person in this work family that you can lean on and talk to, and they've been through the same thing, and they can help walk you through this. The, the, and the people who do that, the, the, uh, there's, yes, well, you've hit a spot with me too because I've been there <laughs> when the, when those guys come through the door. Yeah, yeah, and they they do make a difference. And I, the county that I volunteered in, they brought everybody. Right. If you were a dispatcher or a call taker, and not even took that call, everybody was collected. Right. Another shift came in and completely replaced you. You went to a central place. And they work their magic, like you said. There's a lot of uh, resistance, mm-hmm. you know. Have you know? Heaven forbid, I cry or I have an emotion. But right. those guys know how to work their magic, create a safe space for that. Yeah, and there's a lot of, uh, <clears throat> you know, in the peer support world, because haven't done this for a while. The models have changed over the years, over the years, and the uh, the newer models, they don't focus so much on the group gatherings. They they focus more on the individuals. Uh, but we do the same thing, and now we've uh, what. What we've done with this, uh, the like peer support and the cri- critical incident stuff, is created kind of a matrix. And so, what happens with our our peer support people um, and with our command is, if a call goes out, i.e., uh, baby not breathing, and our deputy responds, and the baby ends up not making it, um, that would trigger that matrix in into effect, which means that the dispatch, our dispatch center. Um, those dispatchers would notify who they need to notify, and it would trigger a response. And so then our peer support group would know that, okay, we need to talk to the deputy that responded to that call. We need to talk to the rest of his squad mates because people don't realize that they get affected by things even though they weren't even on that call. We need to talk to the dispatcher, and the dispatcher was a huge piece that we were missing in the past because, like for cops, what we don't understand is we go to the calls, so we know the whole story. The right. dispatchers, they get a 911 call of somebody frantic, and they dispatch the call, and they kind of know what's going on. But then the deputy gets there, and it just kind of goes dark. And then they're trying to fill in all these blanks, and they're not getting the information. They and that's closure, too. Yeah, and, and that can be more stressful than the guy that actually showed up and took the call. Um, so we we tried to be all-inclusive in, our, in, in who we reach out to. And so uh, when we have a cr- critical incident happen... It immediately triggers that. They start reaching out to those people, um, offering them services, checking on them. And, and we didn't want to overdo it because having been in some critical incidences, the, the one thing that I hate is, you know, you would get that uh, counselor that's in your face. Are you okay? Are you feeling okay? These are the things you're going to feel. And you're just like, get the hell out of my face, dude. Like, I don't, I don't know you. I don't want to talk to you. I just, you know, leave me alone. You, and hit, you hit on a sore spot. I mean, a sore spot, a big spot for me. This is how you should feel. B.S., you take a concealed weapons course, you take any kind of firearms course, right. and you've got somebody you can talk about officer-involved shootings or critical incidents, training, and you've got a guy at the podium, and this is at a lot of conferences, a lot of, mm-hmm. telling you exactly how you're going to process that. Right. Not everybody processes that way. Right. Uh, just like the guy who can w- go to an autopsy and go out and have a cheese sandwich or, yeah. you know, right after. People process things differently. Yeah. And if you're telling somebody this is good and he doesn't feel that way, he's going, what's wrong with No. Right. You're going to process the way you're going to process it, and we're here for you, mm-hmm. and we're here to offer you support. Yeah. But what about knuckleheads? Do they get how do, do they, <laughs> if they get to your level? Because you got some knuckleheads, right? Oh yeah, do, we I all got knuckleheads so, everywhere. I man. do. I do two hours of dumb stuff a day right here in this room, <laughs> so I know what it's like to be a knucklehead and get in trouble. So what happens if I'm a knucklehead and my sergeant's addressed it and? It, it, because I'm sure you hear from everybody. Yeah, yeah, we do. If a knucklehead makes it to my level, he's a special kind of knucklehead because uh, that means he's went through a bunch of levels to screw up. <laughs> uh, as uh, as Frank can tell you a story about being a knucklehead. <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> uh, yeah, so so it, knuckleheads are hard because it depends on what kind of knucklehead they are. So sometimes it's really funny stuff. It is, and and sometimes you have guys that are just those guys that are just. They're good, good people. They mean to do well, and they just cannot make a right decision <laughs> to save their life sometimes. But then you have other ones that are just, you know, being dumbasses, um, and and they continue to do that. Uh, and honestly, there's some, and this is a small percentage, but there's some that have no idea, and 
and you're trying to explain it to them and they're just thousand yard stare and you know sometimes you just think like how in the hell did you even remember to breathe um and again those are small percentages but Dealing with knuckleheads is, you know, I've kind of dealt with it the same my my whole career. And they're they're not all bad. Some no, are, no, some are great no. cops who just do funny stuff that's funny to them, maybe yeah. funny at the moment, but not yeah. funny. To I everybody. mean, we've we've all done it, and we've all, you know, I, I'm a, I'm a jokester, and and you know, I've done some stuff where I was like, ah, that was probably bad timing. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, when you're in front of your lieutenant getting yelled at, you realize, yeah, that was horrible timing. Um, but we just deal with those on a case by case basis. And I mean, uh, you know, if it's, if it's no harm, no foul kind of behavior, like, so I'll, I'll give you a, an instance, uh, and not that he's Watch, a knucklehead. Notice as I lo- lean in and <laughs> prepare my pen to take notes. Yeah. Um, uh, this particular Sergeant wasn't necessarily a knucklehead, but he made a knucklehead move. Um, so it was an early morning. I was a Lieutenant. I was a patrol Lieutenant. And one of my patrol sergeants calls me and he says, uh, are we cool to cuss or? I don't, oh, absolutely. I don't know. Okay. Um, so Ben, are you okay with cussing? <laughs> totally. We didn't, I didn't mean to wake you, Ben. No, <laughs> oh, you're good. Uh, so Sergeant calls me early in the morning. It's like 6am on a Saturday, which was odd, uh, for him to call me then. And so I'm thinking, oh, okay, what's going on? And, and he says, Hey, I want to self report. <laughs> I was oh. like, Okay. And he says, I just told some guy to fuck off. And I said, okay, so give me the full story. So he gives me the full story. Um, and then about 10 minutes after I hang up with him, I get a call from dispatch. Hey, we got a guy that wants to complain about one of your officers. <laughs> and I was like, okay. I, I said, who is it? So he says, I don't, uh, you know, here's the guy's info. And he says, one of your officers yelled profanities at him. And I'm like, all right, cool. I already know the story. So, um, I called the guy and I said, Hey, uh, you know, uh, this is who I am and how can I help you? And he says, well, one of your, one of your officers, he says, I, I don't know his name, but he said there was an accident. And I, I kind of came into that scene and I was trying to get, you know, work my way through. And I went to ask him a question and he told me to fuck off and keep driving. And <laughs> I said, okay, well, so just so you know, sir, I said, it was Sergeant so-and-so and, uh, he already called me and he told me what he did. And he's like, really? And I said, yeah, he, I said, so here's the deal. Um, he's had a long night. They had a long, a lot of screwed up calls. Um, he was about to get off when this accident kicked out. So he's not going home on time. He worked graveyard all night. He's tired. He was frustrated. The people weren't agreeing with him. And, uh, you hit him right at the right moment where he told you to fuck off. And he says, oh, oh, okay, well what's going to happen? And I said, well, so I, I kind of yelled at him and I told him, dude, you can't be telling people that, you know, just because you're having a bad day. And he understood that. And, uh, you know, he, he's not going to do it again. He's a good sergeant. Actually, he's one of my better ones. And, uh, it was just, it's one of those deals, man. He's a human. And the guy says, well, yeah, okay. I'm, I'm good with that. And he says, uh, well, I hope he has a better day, you know, <laughs> like, all right, cool. So, you know, I told the sergeant, Hey dude, he called, he complained. Um, you self-reported. It's it's all good. Uh, please don't tell people to fuck off in the future, okay? And and we called it good. So, you know, you get knucklehead moves like that, but you just, like I said, you just kind of work through it. And the biggest thing I think that happens at our level is guys that get up to this level tend to forget the things that they did during their career. And they tend to forget how people act toward because when you get to this level people treat you differently too than they do just a normal street cop and so you've always got to think from whatever level you're dealing with and so you know when when we're dealing with a a, a deputy i've got to think okay if i was a deputy would this make sense to me yeah you know all right i i could see myself doing that and you know okay i could see myself making a smart ass comment or something on a scene or or laughing when it's inappropriate because we have a dark sense of humor so you just that's the way we like to approach it, and I think, again, that, that helps in our environment is just treating everybody as an independent thinker and dealing with the problem in front of us as it is. That was a – I want to self-report now. And, I'm gonna, <laughs> and I reported this back when it happened, but you, you reminded me of this. As a volunteer of the sheriff's office, mind you, not sworn, not compensated, I volunteered my time. We transport people to jail, not a cop, make very clear – DUI task force years ago. <laughs> I'm there for the food. I'm wearing a hoodie. I have a posse car, uh, so it's got all the lights and all the stuff approved by the sheriff of that county. A motor officer struck on the 101 freeway. My guys go. 
So we make our way there. We don't run coke because we don't. So they're handling it. There's a, a city police been blocking the top of the ramp. Hey, Ed, can you do me a favor? We got a lot going on. Can you take the ramp? That I'm allowed to do. I take that car and sound off signal. I want to thank you again for the $10,000 worth of lights on that vehicle <laughs> because I got to use them. I set out one of my best flare patterns that you ever saw. <laughs> I took that lane. If you came out of Old Town Scottsdale, you're all coming from the clubs with your tight jeans. Yeah, you were coming towards me after you're leaving the club <laughs> empty-handed. So I'm there. Now, I've got on the traffic vest like you're supposed to wear, right. and I've worked all day, and I'm kind of cranky. Some of you may or may not know that. <laughs> and I've got another volunteer with me, and cars are coming, and they're not acknowledging that mosaic of flares, and they're coming up, and I started doing the same thing. I like to go south here. I said, well, you don't get to, you have to go back and go down to the next street, and that'll take you back to the East Valley where you want to go. I'm doing this over and over. Now, meantime, I don't know, because I'm on a different radio, how that officer was at the bottom of the ramp. You know, the freeway is stopped. Uh, so my thoughts, prayers, heart, everything is with this guy. And right. I got these knuckleheads coming out of the clubs, coming up. <laughs> a good and, tune right there. That yeah. is a good tune. Yes. And I finally got, I said, I'm going to entertain myself as I do most days. <laughs> it was an early morning. I was a lieutenant. I was a patrol lieutenant. And one of my patrol sergeants calls me and he says, uh, are we cool to cuss? Or I don't, oh, absolutely. I don't know. Okay. Um, so... <laughs>